Good evening, everyone. Thank you for preparing this so well, Mary. I hardly feel I've got anything to add, really. The message picks up so many nuances of this incredible story, tale, account. And if I begin by saying that I'm always astounded, thank you, that's great, amazed even how often the best known accounts, the things that we think we know off by heart, can suddenly reveal something new. Would you agree with that? And I was reading through some months ago now, um, through John, and I came across this story, which I probably would have told you I knew backwards, and it suddenly lit up for me. And so I'd like to run some things by you concerning that, because I think it has tremendous relevance us today. It really has I, so many things I hadn't seen before and if you've already gleaned them well bear with me will you. <laughs> so first of all this, co these, this conversation is totally unique to John and interestingly it follows another totally unique, unique in the sense that these are one-to-one -one conversations. I don't know anywhere else in the New Testament where Jesus is recorded as having one-on-one -on -one conversations. He teaches in synagogues, in the fields, his disciples. But these two conversations, the first was with Nicodemus. And it forms the bedrock of our doctrine of being born again. It's the most important one-to-one -one conversation. And soon after, after, this conversation with the woman at the well takes place. She's unnamed. We don't even know her name. But both these conversations have outstanding significance for us because they both, I don't know if the word highlight is enough, but the, the work of the Spirit and the significance of the work of the Spirit. So, and the Holy Spirit is central to the, the miracle that takes place here at the well. We're all familiar how it begins. Jesus um, and the Twelve are coming through Samaria on the way back from Judea. It's interesting that Jesus almost certainly has taken the short route. Most Jews would not go through Samaria. They'll take a longer route rather than go through. He's taken a shortcut and he's coming right through Samaria and he clearly knows what he has in mind. Can I just give you a very potted, forgive me, and it is potted history of Samaria. Um, the kingdom of Israel had been joined as one. That was God's intent for it, under one king. Uh, temple worship, the law of Moses, had all been given to the Jews as one people. Twelve <coughs> tribes, one people. And very shortly after Solomon's reign, the kingdom had been split in two. Um, strife, differences over doctrine, uh, everything that we know all about what, what men always do with God's rules. They'd created their own kingdom, their own temple, and they were in complete rebellion. And of course, very soon they fell into serious apostasy. They included in their worship all the Canaanite kind of um, religion around them, even to the sacrificing of their own children. It was that bad. So the Jews had kept very themselves very much in their religiosity away from the Samaritans. They were beneath contempt. Incidentally, and that is a potted history, I've only just discovered that in 2 Kings 17, 2 Kings 17, one chapter gives the most succinct and easy to understand um, account of the split and its consequences, if you're interested in that. It makes quite a difference. So, coming back to this um, conversation. The disciples have left. They've gone to get food. Jesus is alone at the well, and along comes this Samaritan woman. I can imagine her consternation at finding this um, single Jew at the well, sitting on the well, the word says. And Jesus says, will you give me some water? And as we've just heard, she says, you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, uh, f for uh, water? Not a promising beginning. This lady's a feisty lady. She's tough. 
her, her life has been tough, clearly. She's learned to look after herself. She's not about to be patronized by this Jew. She's very self-assured in herself and also in her views of religion. Jesus quietly pursues his agenda. He never answers in kind. Um, and he ignores this first remark of hers. And he just says, if you knew, if only you knew the free gift of God and who it is that asks for you for water, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. All the time, she's using the context that she understands, the well, water, giving life. And it's just amazing the way she, he, she says to him, well, okay, I mean, they're talking on parallel lines here. Jesus is talking spiritual things. She's talking according to her sense knowledge and her hostility, actually, to him at this stage. Well, how do you intend to give me living water? The well's deep, you've nothing to draw with, etc., etc. And then she adds insult to injury, and she says to him, do you think you're greater than our father, Jacob? She knows their common heritage. And it's a very good question. And she will very soon know the answer to this question. She's standing in front of the creator of the whole earth, and she's asking him, are you better than Jacob? Anyway, she gets her answer in the end. We watch as Jesus gently reels her in. He ignores this too. He doesn't get sidetracked to answer this question yet. He simply says to her, whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever would drink the water that I give in him, it will be like a spring of water that leads to everlasting life. Still not to be outdone, she kind of, well, I think it's she's joking at the moment. She says to him, uh, well, you better give me some of this water so I don't have to come back again and again to this well. I could do with this kind of water. I love this woman. But the point is, Jesus does too. He just loves this woman. But now Jesus abruptly changes the whole course of this conversation, which is apparently going nowhere. And he says to her, go and fetch your husband and then come back with him. As Mary's already read, she says, I haven't got a husband. You speak truthfully. You've had five husbands. He cuts right through her wall of defense. And he says, and the man you're with now isn't even your husband. She's absolutely staggered. And you can, you can almost see her defences, all that wall she's got around herself, begins to drop. And she concedes and says, well, I can see you're a prophet, but we have pretty deep um, beliefs, differences, belief differences. You Jews say that we can only worship in, in uh, Jerusalem. Um, but our fathers have always worshipped here. I mean, these things took place a, lo a long time before her time. And now Jesus reveals to her that the old is coming to an end. I think you've got, is that up on the screen? Or it doesn't matter. He reveals to her that the old ways are coming to an end and quickly. In fact, he says, the time is now. And what he's really saying to her is, the old covenant is going to be superseded now in God's redemption plan. Nothing wrong with the old, but now is God's plan to move us forward together and that we're going to be able to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And he's speaking of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says, as you've already um, listened to, what you're called and where you worship will no longer matter. In fact, it doesn't even matter now. Your spirit must engage with the Holy Spirit in the 
pursuit of truth. Did she understand what he was saying? Uh, no, she, she didn't. She is engaged, but she doesn't understand what she's saying. She will, very shortly. And I can just see her shrugging her shoulders and saying, well, I don't know, but I do know this. When the Messiah comes, see, she's looking for Messiah, he will settle this. He'll tell us all things. And it's now that Jesus says the most extraordinary thing to her. He looks her in the eye and he says, I am he. In fact, he isn't in the original. He just says to her, I am. I am is speaking. And it's so astounding to me that he would reveal himself completely unambiguously, not calling himself the son of man. He's not, he often goes around the houses on this one, but he's looking at this woman, the Samaritan woman at that, and he says, I am he, I am Messiah. Well, we're not told of her reaction, but she leaves everything at that moment. She puts down her bucket or whatever it is you get water out of a well with. And the first part of this encounter of the well um, finishes. She leaves it and she rushes off uh, to bring the half the town or maybe the whole town back with her. And it's interesting what she says to them. She says, surely this is the Christ. He has told me everything I ever did. So we know that Jesus has told her much more than she's had five husbands. It's not recorded. Everything that I ever did, he's re recalled her own life to her. No wonder she is convinced that he's the Christ. Well, just at this point, the disciples return with their goodies for lunch. And they're about to experience a massive learning curve as well. This is one whole story. Um, they can't believe their eyes that Jesus, of all people, would be speaking to a woman on her own and a Samaritan woman at that. They don't ask him why. They, they don't, I guess. But they do what they've come to do. They press him to eat because they're all tired. And then Jesus says something quite mysterious to them. He says, I have food about which you know nothing. My food is to do the will of God and to finish his work. They first misunderstand what he's saying and wonder where he's got his food from. Then he says, my food is to do the will of my father and to finish his work. So Jesus is answering their unasked question, what are you doing with this woman? Though I doubt they quite understand it at the minute. And suddenly Jesus brings their attention so apropos of nothing, he brings their attention, he points out the fields that are clearly are surrounding this ground. And he says to them, have a look at the fields around you. You say they're not ripe for harvest, but I say the harvest is ripe now. And Surely at this point they're beginning to realize that Jesus is talking to them about something quite different. The, har the point is, the harvest is always now. This is the point Jesus is getting across to these men. The harvest is now. And right now, back comes the harvest. She, the Samaritan woman, I don't like not her not ha having her name, but she comes back with half the town in tow, which, if you think about it, an hour ago would have been absolutely unthinkable. And it doesn't record what the disciples are thinking at this moment, but they must have their jaws open. Back comes a Samaritan woman, got half a town with her, and Jesus is talking about harvest fields. If ever you worry about how slow you are on the uptake, <laughs> um, it comforts me because the disciples so often were. But they, they're getting there. The Samaritans come back and they beg Jesus to stay. And Jesus of Nazareth stays in the Samaritan village for two whole days, teaching them. They are utterly open to what? And we know later on from Acts 14, I think it is, that the 
um, the apostles hear that the Samaritans are believers. So they hurry down to uh, Samaria and they find out that they are, but they're not baptized in the spirit. Obviously, the spirit wasn't given when Jesus preached them. So they lay hands on them and they were baptized in the spirit. And that's exactly what Jesus said in the harvest. One sows, another reap. That was a big lesson for the um, apostles at that time. But anyway, I digress. And that's the end of these, this incredible account, which took into account a sinner, a woman who wasn't a believer or thought she was, a whole town, everything turned on its head, including his disciples, who couldn't have dreamt this scenario up. And they were learning from Jesus about harvest, and that harvest is always now. So, in concluding this, we have to ask ourselves how it's relevant to us, because otherwise it just remains as just a rollicking good story. But there are so many things that we can uh, glean from this, and I don't pretend that these are all of them, but just some of them. First of all, Jesus is our teacher. He is our example. We're exhorted everywhere to reach, to be like Jesus. A few more obvious points. The harvest is always now for us. That's the way we look on harvest. This conversation doesn't take part in a designated place of worship. It's not in a synagogue. It's not church-centered, we would say. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Big lesson there. But most important of all, in my eyes, this whole miracle turns on one thing, which was a word of knowledge. It was when Jesus told her about her life, everything she'd ever did, tells her to go and get her husband, knows that she's had five. That's a word of knowledge. That's a word of knowledge. The gift of the Spirit. How many round and round conversations have we had with members of our own family or people that we're longing to convict who... who seem to want to know, but we're getting nowhere. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had like that. The point is, we can't, no matter how much zeal we have, how much, without the Spirit of God, without the Spirit of God. But you might think, ah, oh, yeah, but this was Jesus. Yes, it was Jesus, and filled without measure of the Spirit. But this was Jesus in his humanity. Jesus, the man, filled with the Spirit, did all of his works. If he would invoke, or had invoked his deity, that would be some kind of sick joke to do all these things, because he tells us, or he's telling his disciples when he was preparing them for the fact that that he was going to go back to his father. And he said, assuredly, most assuredly, actually he says, verily twice. And when Jesus says verily twice, you better listen. He said, I'm telling you that whomever, whomever believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. I mean, that's an extraordinary statement. Jesus is the truth. He always tells the truth. And then he goes on to say, and because I'm going to my Father, you will do greater things. We know what he means by this. They were afraid to let him go, the disciples, and he said, I'm not going to leave you alone as orphans, but I will come to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. I will give you the Holy Spirit. The thing is, the Holy Spirit is the gift giver, and we have such need of these gifts. As I said, no amount of zeal and loving Jesus will accomplish much, apart from exhaustion. And Paul is very clear in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 about these gifts. 
which we need to really revive, I feel. They're, these gifts are tools that Jesus has given to his church to use with great effect. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, as here, turned this whole thing on its head. The word of wisdom, faith, prophecy, tongues, the interpretation of tongues, miracles, how about miracles, and healings, all the things we long to do. And Jesus said he's given us the tools in the form of the Holy Spirit, who will give us these gifts as we ask for them. It's more than ask, and it's more than a suggestion. It's actually a command. Earnestly desire the gifts of the Spirit. In my translation, the word is covet. It's the only place I know in the Bible where you're commanded to covet anything. Covet the gifts and that suggests to me that we have to really want before the Holy Spirit gives. It's our wanting, our praying, longing for these tools to change things and to bring glory to Jesus. After all, we wouldn't give gifts or presents of great value to somebody who was indifferent. It's a bit crude, but you know that, that's one way of looking at it. And the fact is that Jesus operated in all of them, in all of his ministry, whether he's in somebody's house, in the fields, wherever he was, he operated. He was the great prophet. He had marvelous prophetic, anyway, miracles, healings, everywhere he went. And here's our template. One word supernaturally changed everything and can go on changing things for us. I want to say very quickly, um, Ian here was sweet enough to pray for me the other day, and I was feeling pretty overwhelmed with circumstances that were, well, overwhelming. And he asked me a question, and I thought for a moment, and I answered him. It didn't seem of great... But when I went home, I realized that question was a word of knowledge. And it really change the direction of my thinking and of my praying. And I've shared that with Ian tonight and he was as surprised as I was <laughs> to realize, okay, it didn't bring half the town back, but it changed me. And, you know, we need, we need these gifts in the church to go out of the church. And we need to understand them. I'm sure you agree with me. Don't you long to see these things? Yeah. Well, I do. Um, so yes, Paul uh, exhorts us to covet these gifts. And the reason they're given is very clear. It's for the building up of the body. It's to change things, things that we can't know about. It's for the building up of the body and to make a difference out there. And so, and if we ask earnestly, he's going to give. He will give severally as he will and in conclusion I just want to say this it's dark out there it's very dark and it's going to get darker we can pray for peace and uh, it, it isn't going to happen it's going to get darker the gospels are very clear about this Jesus is very clear about what's going to be happening in the days before he comes back again and it's not a pretty sight and so, bearing that in mind, I mean, you've only got to look. Apostasy in the church, a, a country that has turned away from God increasingly, disorder, and all the things that Paul listed in his letter to Timothy. But the point is, that's the very reason why God would be, the Lord Jesus would be stirring us up in this time. If we're to be light in that darkness, there's a harvest out there. People are lost and baffled by what's going on, and I'm not surprised. But the, a strong church who can really use the tools that it's been given to go into that darkness, to reap the harvest, what a difference it's going to make. Wherever we go these days, we're hearing about the Spirit of God and how much we need the Spirit of God. And I'm not surprised because 
the church really has got to start shining and making a difference. Looking very solemn. I hope you're agreeing with me. Um, the final scripture is in, in, script, in um, Ephesians 5, when Paul, the teacher of the church, says this, Do not be drunk with wine, in which there's dissipation, or he's talking about sin, but instead be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had the Spirit without measure. I know that. He had unfettered. And there was lots of things that fetter us and ground us. And all our lives were working out our salvation and getting rid of the things that block the work of the Holy Spirit working through us. But so much grace surrounds us. We've been forgiven everything. We keep short accounts with the Lord. I can see why we would be unfettered too. So keeping our access to the Holy Spirit uncluttered is one of the things that we need to do. And surely unconfessed sin or anger, bitterness, whatever, are the only things that can hinder the working of the Holy Spirit. The scripture says that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. He clearly can be grieved. So I believe, hope and pray that the Lord is bringing new revelation into his church, into his beloved church. The revelation of the Spirit of God given to us for a purpose for these times. And so I end with that. Um, I'd like to pray, if that's all right with you. Lord God, we, we say to you with our hearts that we welcome and need a revelation of what you're speaking to us, your church in these times. The revelation of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us to bring glory to Jesus. A revelation of the tools you've given us to do them to use and to bring this about. And I pray, Lord, that you would give to your church um, universally, but here at Berniston, this new revelation that we so need. Thank you that we've not been left alone to carry out your works, but that you have given to each one who believes and is baptized your spirit. So teach us, Lord, now how to walk in the spirit, how to listen, how to follow the spirit's leading, because we earnestly desire his gifts. We want to see lives that will be changed forever. So help us, Lord, now to be expectant and to stay expectant, to be bold and to be faithful. And we ask above all things, Father, that Jesus will be glorified in these very dark days. And we ask all this in his precious name. Amen. Amen.